Hey everybody, Chawan here. Today I am fucking stoked to be talking to Jason Miller. I was always troubled by a question that would get asked a lot of, of magical people, pagans, magicians, etc. And, and it's sort of like, well, if magic works, why don't you have your shit together? It's not because magic doesn't work. I think most people who try a spell get a result and they realize it works. But we use it sometimes in ways that are not particularly smart and we don't ground it in any kind of real world knowledge of the thing that we're after. You know, it's been a hot minute since we spoke. You obviously have a very full schedule of super full life, and yet you've come out with a new book. You know, you're constantly updating your blog. You're doing tons of interviews. What they are, the, the lower spirits around the path you're working or tradition, maybe they do. Um, so, and, and the people that wrote the grimoires that, that all. Plus you're taking care of your family. So I yeah. mean, do you sleep? <laughs> sleep is for the dead. Uh, that's <laughs> what it is. The post that you put up recently about the, I can't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Chaonimism. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty. I, I don't know how to pronounce it either. I wrote it for a long time, many many years ago. I was, you know, would describe myself as a chaos magic practitioner. And what happened is, I started to, you know, I started to realize that spirits were real, gods were real, in a way that most chaos magic doesn't really acknowledge. Chaos magic tends to think of the gods and spirits as simply something for us to believe in and that it's our belief itself that does the work. And so I started to, to kind of experiment and find out that traditional approaches were working better for me than non-traditional approaches. And that even if this was true, if it is the belief itself that, that is the key, then it's, it's disingenuous to think that you can just conjure up belief out of nowhere in the same, I don't know, volume, capacity that somebody who is really dedicated uh, can. So whether it is the the object of belief, the spirit or, or God that is real, or in fact the belief itself, either way, the traditional method and approach is going to yield you a better result. I started to approach reality as, uh, as if everything had consciousness, as if everything had spirit, that, 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 Spirit was in abundance and consciousness was all around and, and and the world was alive. But I still kept a lot of my uh, streamlining from chaos magic, my freedom of thought and, and, and ritual construction and, and uh, the general acceptingness of throwing out an idea, even if it's thousands of years old, just saying, nope, we don't need this anymore. Uh, as I was recently reminded, it was the inability to throw out something that was thousands of years old that basically kept us in a geocentric universe for 2,000 years. Like, well, Ptolemy said it, and Plato said that the, the planets should move in circles. So if you say something different, you're going against these guys. And who wants to do that? Well, you know, finally Copernicus did. I left chaos magic, and I was very critical of it for years, and I was, I was sort of looking for that post-chaos magic. If you Google, like, Jason Miller post-chaos, you'll see a bunch of, of ramblings about me, wondering what comes next, and so on. And what happened is, is that chaos magic took care of itself. 
Uh, Gordon White came on the scene, Rune Soup. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. He has this animist view. And he, I think more than anyone, pegged this link of animism and chaos magic uh, together. He never abandoned uh, chaos magic, but clearly under him, it is very different than Peter Carroll's chaos magic. Or, or even Phil Hines' Chaos Magic. And then um, Aiden Watcher just came out with a new book. The, the Everybody's familiar with his wonderful talismans. I think I have one. Yeah, I have a Cyprian talisman right here. Um, but he just wrote a kick-ass new book called Six Ways. And the view he describes in there is essentially chaos magic meets animism. And as I was reading it and, and probably listened to Pod uh, Rune Soup earlier that day on the treadmill, I started to think, you know, chaos and animism, canimism. <laughs> and then I, I was doing uh, Jim Harold's podcast, and he started asking me about, you know, my view of the world, and I was like, it's canimism. <laughs> People were getting okay results with chaos magic, and they were getting better results with some traditional magic. Even the traditional people that are traditionally minded were getting away from the Golden Dawn and Aleister Crowley and digging deeper into the past, into the Renaissance era and the Greek magical papyri and things like that. Uh, so I think it was natural for people who were interested in chaos magic and maybe they were getting good results with sigils um, and, and to then start looking at these other methods that are not rooted in the golden dawn and Aleister Crowley and streamlining them a bit. But if you really delve into traditional magic and you try to do it, it becomes this sort of, I don't know, focus on the past that isn't healthy either. So you're kind of like, I don't know, LARPing or live action role playing what it is to be Henry Cornelius Agrippa in the 1500s. And I'm going to go to find a Latin mass and go to mass and, and before my uh, ritual and, and stuff like this. And that's great if that's what you love. And, and some people like uh, Freder Ashen, it's, it's the love of the craft itself that, that drives them. Um, but a lot of people were looking for more streamlined methods that still utilized and, and took advantage of, of traditional modes of, of magic. And so, again, you have this canonism, this sort of new chaos magic emerging. I call what I do sorcery, and I always, I always have. Uh, very practical, you know, uh, not really worried about whether something is traditional or new and cutting edge. I don't care about any of that. I'm, I'm functional. Uh, so I call what I do strategic sorcery. I've been trying to write a book for years now, not a nonfiction book, but a fiction ebook. And mm -hmm. writing a book is hard. You've written at least four books by now, right? Three or four? This new one is number five. Five. Holy shit. I try to do a book once every two to three years. and But ultimately, it really has to be that something out there needs to be written. The book is about best practices for spells, not a spell book. This is like the 21 probably most important points for, for actually making your magic matter. There's a business book that came out relatively recently. Um, I think his name is Ray Dalio. Anyways, the book is called Principles. And he said his company runs on these principles. His life runs on these principles. And so would you say that elements of spell crafting, it's kind of like that? It's about principles? It is. It is. Yeah. It, it is about principles. Um I think it was Emerson who said, you know, the methods of any one thing are many, but the principles are few. And if you can grasp the principles, the methods in any 
particular situation will be self-evident. I think most magic works. Most people do a spell and get a result. It's just looking back, did that result matter or did you find somebody's wallet in the street and, you know, you got to go see Black Panther for free? Um, <laughs> Still a good day. Yeah, you know, it's a good day and it's it's like a nice little, hey, magic is real, pat on the back. and and But in the end, it was sort of like, okay, so what? Um, you know, if it, and... That's why uh, I don't focus overly much on paranormal stuff or, or like the really out of this world results that do happen. Um, you know, paranormal stuff does happen. Miraculous results happen. Those kind of like I did a spell an hour ago and it just happened. Um, it Yeah, exactly. So those kind of things do happen because it's magic. But they're not the kinds of things you want to bank on. You you don't want your plan to be like, well, you know, I'm 40 and no prospects and no education, but magic's going to do it for me. I'll be a millionaire next now. year. <laughs> Mega millions. I've been doing a lot of financial magic for a while and I used your financial sorcery book so I asked for more money and it happened so oh you know it should be like done and happily ever after however it wasn't happily ever after I was working 18 hours a day um, one of the reasons why I'm sick right now and I've been sick for three weeks is because I work way more than even the average Korean person and Koreans work more than anybody else in the you know like the developed world so, I know, <laughs> and you laugh. We have a cartoon about that. You exactly. I was looking through the cartoon. Yes, yes, that one right there. <laughs> I went through the book at least two times. Like I highlighted it the first time, and then I made underlines and stuff. Because I was just like, I'm gonna try to really troubleshoot. There's like five keys I start because I was like, I kind of didn't really think about those keys. This book would be great for anybody who has thrown a spell and it's just like, you know what? It's not going as smoothly as I thought. It does have 21 separate sort of guidelines. So it's also like a really good reference to just go back and be like, oh, forgot about this. Oh, forgot that, about that. That was the idea. Um, the, the publisher decided to call it Elements of Spellcrafting because they said it reminded them of Elements of Writing. So, you know, as a book someone might have on their shelf and pull down and think, you know, well, what is, what's the protocol for this? Yeah. And then kind of go in and, and uh, you know, reference that. There's certain keys, like checking links and everything matters in magic, where I'm just like, I didn't even think about it. Key 4 and key 12. Like, on how to actually do the specific magic. I've done something similar myself, and... and uh, Rufus Opus and I did the same working at the same time without even knowing about it. And we were both, both, we both had day jobs at the time and we both were doing this magic to get our businesses running, our side business, strategic sorcery and his, uh, gray work, uh, courses. We were both saying, you know, pump this up, you know? And the angel just kind of looked at our day jobs and was like, well, you know what? You need to make more money doing this. Let's just get rid of those day jobs and then you'll have tons of time. And so we both got laid off. Um, essentially, you know, an angel laid us off. Um, and so it was not terribly skillful on our parts to not protect the day job. So it worked out better for you at least in, in the case that you didn't suddenly lose uh, your your day job before you were ready to. So it's not so much about what did I do wrong, so much as, okay, that wasn't enchantable. How do we then move the board to make it more enchantable? So in other words, you know what? I wasn't set up to receive a ton of money doing, you know, uh, 
you didn't say exactly what, but we'll we'll assume it's something really saucy, mm-hmm. and, and we'll just say, <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, job X. And so then it's a matter of well, let's let's look at the scalability. Some people, when they start thinking, okay, I want to, I don't know, give massages or something, and and I want to make a hundred thousand dollars. Like, well, you're either charging a hell of a lot for a massage, or your hands are going to be crippled by the end of a week because it's going to take an inordinate amount of massaging to get this done. <laughs> so they're not looking at how to scale their their project up to the to the money that they want to make. So there's that. And if that's not the issue, then it could be a visibility issue where it's not so much about charging, about getting the money, but about getting the visibility. And Kelly, uh, 1000 True Fans, talks about this as a model for sustainability. So that can then be the work rather than the the money aspect let's work on the 1000 people who are so rapidly into what i put out there that they will buy whatever my next product is or project or art or you know whatever it is you're doing let's say that we have a, a young magician and she want she she has a day job and I'm going to envision somebody who may be a typical viewer of this channel. She has a day job, and the day job is okay. It could pay more, whatever. But her real passion is in her side gig, and she wants to go full-time into that. So she's right. like, okay, I'm going to do the mundane work, but I also want to use magic. So she looks at key one, and she's like, okay, I accept that in key one it says that magic is an influence not a miracle worker you know it's doing things so that it's maybe 70 80 percent there and then magic to sort of push it to 100 percent or close to 100 percent. so she's like got it then she's like okay looks at the next key and she's like my goal is not small and crappy but it's not improbable either she's like i want to make let's say in her day job she makes like thirty thousand dollars a year She's like, okay, if I make $30,000 a year at my side gig, totally doable, that I can do that full time. So she's like, I'm going to start with that. How would you advise her to use your book in a realistic way to achieve that goal? Okay, so what is her side gig? Because the devil is always in the detail. Let's say that her side gig is... She wants to do tarot readings. Okay. So she wants to make $30,000 a year doing tarot readings. Totally readings. doable. Yeah, yoga instructor, whatever it is that she would love to do. Totally do. So are we, you know, but it, it matters if we're talking online or in person. Both, but I guess mainly online. First thing is, I would do some tarot reading myself to see what is the most lucrative focus to begin with. Because cultivating a local community and cultivating an online community are two very different things. Ah, community, okay. Mm -hmm. And, And what happens is that if you if you split your focus then you do neither of them really well. I would start with a divination. Say, where should I focus my energies at first? You can always segue into something into the other after you've already established yourself. The next thing I would do is I would figure out some way to differentiate myself from the other people doing what I do. For instance, I, I know somebody that does Reiki. Right, and everybody in the the woo woo community does Reiki. You can't swing a cat without knocking over a Reiki master. And, and so, but this person was also uh, a a well, shouldn't say he was. He is uh, a police officer. He's ex special forces, and he's a mixed martial artist. 
you take the Reiki and then you take all these people that are getting the crap beat out of them. Right. <laughs> and that's your, you know, that's your client face because there's nobody else servicing those people specifically. And so you try to find just something that hasn't been done that you have a niche that, that you really authentically fulfill. And honestly, you know, let's say it's tarot. It could be as simple as a deck nobody uses or a style that no one appreciates. Camellia uh, Elias has made a name for herself just by, by taking a European way of reading the cards and focusing in on the Marseille Tarot, which no one, when she started, very few people, not no one, uh, was really focused on and started her blog, Tarot Flections, where she was, you know, putting out all this great stuff. Impressionable. Maybe you don't want to, to be open to what you, the person to the left says, what the person to the right says. Oh, this one says this, and the other one says that, and then you say to them. So, magic wise, I would start with the divination, see where my efforts should go. Then I might work with Mercury to get things moving. Open up the doors. You can do a road opening. Uh, the, using the Abre, the famous Abre Camino spell or, or anything else, just to open up more opportunity. I would argue that too much road opening paralyzes one with opportunity and that, you know, once you walk through a door, uh, it's no longer time for road opening as it is for wayfinding. You know, you, you, you have an idea where you want to go. You just don't necessarily know the way there. So now it's a matter of wayfinding spells. So this is where we're going to get into uh, obstacle removers like Vajrakilaya. This is where we're going to get into great facilitators like Mercury who know every path and can help you uh, find your way. Hecate also is amazing at this. You know, this is, this is the, the goddess who led Demeter to her daughter through the underworld. So she can lead anyone to anyone. Any, Hecate Phosphorus and, and Propylia, she can both open those roads and lead you down them. You know, so she holds a, a special place in the heart and so you kind of you do a spell to have your way made once your road is open and then it's a matter of bringing people to you so sticking with the planets moving into the sun uh, I always think that the sun is an underutilized planet for because I think people stay away from the sun because it's it's so general. It's right there in the middle of the tree of life. Uh, you know, you've got love, you've got Venus, you've got business, you've got Jupiter, you've got message, you've got Mercury, you want war, you've got uh, Mars. But the sun is is achieves all these things in a different kind of way. Um, Venus is that attraction that's sort of the sultry, go out and attract someone, whereas the sun is sort of like, I don't know, the 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 golden tan hard body on the beach that people just come running towards. <laughs> um, same thing with business. It's, it, you know, you set up shop, you do this huge sun ritual, you're casting your light out, Right. You're, and you're getting people to talk more about it. And then from the mundane angle, literally tell people, did you like that? Could you write something about it? Um, you, you're, you're in, in uh, a couple of my classes, so you know I'm not shy. Like when somebody's like, I got a great field report. And I was like, great, can I make this public? Can I, you know, 
can you can you put your name to it? He's seventeen. That you should work outside the column. So would you recommend that a new witch focus? Okay, so let's say she's already kind of working with Venus because she really wanted to get a boyfriend. Then right. she should just keep working with Venus. Like even though Venus isn't somebody who's traditionally used for a new business venture, just stick with Venus. Absolutely. Venus is amazing for business. Um, Venus is amazing for business. First of all, obviously for women, there's an added benefit that um, women are underrepresented in the planetary gods and goddesses. Um, but there's also just, you know, Venus is the planet of production. Um, it, it's literally how people produce people. There, there are two ways to run sort of enchantment spells for a business. There, and, and really, in my opinion, as a business owner, there, there's a good way and a bad way. So a good way is you do this spell and you ask for Venus to bring you the people who would love your work. Right. And you use that language because there's all kinds of love. So, you know, you're, you're asking for people who to just like you would go to Venus and say, bring me somebody who is going to fall in love with me. Right. As opposed to there's a guy down the hall <laughs> and I want to make him. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the good way. And Venus works amazing for that. Karukula works amazing for that. Um, there's, there's tons of rituals where Karukula, uh, is reaching out in the 10 directions and she's finding and hooking the people and bringing them towards you. You know, the, the texts say under your power, but really it's more that she's grabbing the right people and, and magnetizing them. So think of think of the power of the lodestone and attraction in corporation with Venus. Venus works really well with spirits of the earth as well. So getting that mojo going is is, is big. Um, and then the bad way to do it is the sort of targeted enchantment on customers that I I always tell people to avoid. Like if you've got a customer base, don't use magic to get them to buy shit. Oh. Just create shit that they want to buy <laughs> and, and use magic to help you figure out what that is. And use magic to bring you more people that want your stuff. But um, lately I've been, I've been doing a little, I guess, diligence, you might call it to point out the areas where magic might be counterproductive or less than helpful. So for instance, uh, other than sort of cultivating, you know, tight bonds, peace or something like that, I'm not a big fan of, of say using coercive love magic in a marriage or something like that. To me, it just goes against the very nature of what that should be about. Now, for other people, they can do what they want. I'm just saying, for me, it all has the feeling of a hard, coercive sell. Have you ever been somewhere where they're like really hard selling you on something? And maybe it worked, and you bought it. And you're walking away going, why the hell did I buy this? Yeah, so icky. So I'm not big on like coercive magic for like enchanting the customers when they walk through your door to spend. I don't go in for any of that. I go in for the magic that helps pull the right people to you, magic that helps you shine, get your message across for business. That's the stuff that works for a long term sustainable business. Sound like somebody's dad. I mean, I am somebody's dad, but you know, I'm like, don't you use that negative magic now in your business? <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people, and you mentioned this in your book, they use magic for emergencies, and oftentimes, emergency means that you are trying to control a situation and control people. Sometimes you just got to do that, and there's this one. Sometimes part you, have to. you have to. 
And there's this one story you tell in the book about how you used a super soaker to, you know. Um, so when it when is it the right time to use that sort of magic versus the let me shine? Well, you know, it it everyone comes across conflict in life. And you can't let people bully you around. You can't, um, you have to fight at times. I, I value peace, but I don't value peace at the price of justice. Or at times somebody is, is just, um, comes into conflict. They want something, you want something, and it's important and vital that you get it. And, uh, so it's in situations where you're in direct competition, uh, and it warrants, we'll call it the level of force or the level of coercion. Um, and you know, some people out there are just straight up sociopaths. They're like, you know, you and I are going for the same position. Um, you know, you're going home, figuring it out what kind of Jupiterian magic to, to will help you shine more. And I'm going home to figure out how to kill you. <laughs> and so, you know, there, there is that approach and some people are prone to it. Um, and then, but most of the time it's not like that. a few years ago, somebody was having some problem uh, with a zealous government regulator for the business that they run. And they're like, you know, how do I do magical combat against this agency? And I'm like, you, you don't. <laughs> you know, they're in, in gigantic government bureaucracy. Um, unless the United States were to fall, they're not going anywhere. However, once you get assigned a person, once there's a person showing up to inspect things, once there's a person who's making recommendations, now you've got something that you can enchant. Now you've got somebody that you can either sweeten or you can take their photo and their name that they signed off and put it in your shoe so that you're walking on them all day long. You can, you know, tie their image up with Karukula's red thread and and uh, dangle them over some noxious bend over incense in the middle of the night so that they're twisting and, and twirling in the incense while you're chanting for them to do what you demand them to do. Or you can confuse the hell out of them with, with poppy seeds and, you know, do a ritual where you summon the spirits of confusion and demons and things like that, and then start flinging black mustard and poppy seeds at their image. It's all fun. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, black you're magic. getting excited talking about You know, you, you know, talk I mean, about there's... micro enchantments and macro enchantments, and that's reminding me of what you wrote in the book about how you have the overall goal, and maybe your overall goal is, I want to stop the government from doing some shitty thing. It could be, you know, taking it down a level. It could be that your tarot reader is in a town that has legislation about being a tarot reader. And they've never enforced it. But all of a sudden, you know, there's a knock on the door. And I'm like, you can't do that here, you know. So um, it could be something like that. It could just, it could be anything. So, yeah, your macro enchantment is that one spell that everyone does. This is what I want to happen. This is the spell I want to make that happen. And so maybe it's a Ganesha Puja. Maybe it's a Novena. Maybe it's a big planetary working. Whatever it is, it's aimed directly at that final outcome that you want. Final outcome. But then the micro-enchantments come in because, you know, you do the mundane work, as you say, and... and People have been saying for years, first comes the working and then comes the work, right? So what micro-enchantment does, it says, well, let's take this one step further. There's the working, the macro-enchantment to get what we want. 
And here's the work, all the things that we need to do to get there. The micro-enchantment says, let's enchant each of those steps on the path. So let's enchant immediately when we're nowhere in regulatory trouble. Let's enchant using Mercury or whatever powers we're comfortable with or, or even Jupiter as the, the big governing body. Let's enchant to get the most sympathetic people on this because that can make or break everything. Every Groups are grammatical fiction. Everything comes down to people. And people are enchanted. Even when a huge corporation or, or uh, government body is not. So you do a ritual to attract the, the, the most uh, reasonable and sympathetic people get brought to your case. And then you begin to enchant each step. So you meet this person, you do a little, you get their cards, and then you do a little enchantment that's sweetening. You maybe use the sweetening glyph from, um, from what's that great book? Financial Sorcery by yeah. Jason Miller. That's it. Um, so you use the lightning glyph there. And maybe on the underside of the lightning glyph, you have the dominating glyph. So that, like, if this fails, then this kicks in. You know, it's like a, it's like a chain. Yeah. yeah. I do that all the time. I, I'll, I'll put the dominating glyph on the back of the sweetening glyph as sort of like a, uh, you know, here's the knife. Nice, but if you don't, I'm going to smack the crap out of you. People would always say, you know, like, do the magic once and then... Pretend like it already worked and don't do anything else because then it's lust for results. It's like you don't believe it's going to happen. But what you're saying is quite the opposite. Yeah, I all almost all of that stuff that we were taught getting into magic, I it's garbage. <laughs> Much of it of that advice is built on the presumption that there's some like power that really like well she didn't believe that the magic would work so we're not gonna make the spell work because she didn't believe strong enough no spirits care <laughs> how much you believe in it and and we can say okay well we're undercutting our own surety that this will happen maybe there's something to that but it is more than compensated for by the extra effort and magic that you put into it. So the same thing with forgetting, you know, cast it and then forget it. So it's out of your conscious mind. I know, you know, you know what you want. So it's not out of your conscious mind. Um, I, I think that's one of the big chaos magic things that people threw out you know, almost immediately, this idea that they need to forget their sigils and things like that for them to work. Yeah, like, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that I got from your book. I realized that I did the macro enchantment, um, but I didn't micro enchant along the way, which is micro enchanting for the side gig. I didn't take advantage of that. Instead, right. I was just letting this final micro enchantment do its thing, and it was just like growing and growing. But what about the little steps of, oh, the, you know, that little side opportunity that I had, I could have done magic on that to make it grow as well. But I didn't because I thought I was supposed to put all my faith into that final objective. And what you're suggesting yeah. and what I really learned from the book was, being, you know, you, you can sort of kind of do it as you go along as well. Yeah, and, and you know, as, as things open up and change, then then your micro enchantment can change with, with can change how things are steering as opportunities open up. And you know, the other thing that, about that is you don't have to accept the first success. And this is something that flies in the face of what a lot of people believe that, like, if magic gives you something. You need to take it and value it and, you know. Thank you. And I've got a student, and she is like, uh, 
like one of my heroes uh, because she, she she used strategic sorcery. You know, she took time off to to give birth and raise her kids through toddlerness, and then once they were old enough to go to preschool, she said, "I want to work. I want to get back in the game." And so she decided she didn't want to go back in the game at a pay cut. She wanted to get back in the game at a pay raise. And so she immediately went for a six-figure salary. Not She had a healthy salary before, but, you know, she wasn't going to, to settle for this. Well, you've been home for three years. You know, you, you're not going to start where you left off. She's like, no, I'm not going to start where I left off. I'm going to go ahead because I'm, I'm so well worth it. And so um, – she did, and she got the um, she got a six figure job, which is more than she had ever made. And she said no. The hours were like sixty hours or fifty hours a week, which is not unreasonable for that level. Uh, five days a week at the office, and she said, "You know what?" with new kids, and now that I'm thinking about it, I think I can do better. I think what I want is to make this money, and I want to work from home three days a week and have my total hours not exceed, you know, around 40. Is that possible? They went for it. They went for it. Because she re-enchanted. She, she gave an offering of thanks because the spirit came through, right? So, so you, you, wanna, you always have to pay the spirits and, and uh, acknowledge that the magic worked and say, okay, you know, you did what I asked you to do. Now I'm changing my mind. Like, now I want something more. You can change your mind? Yeah, she went. She she wanted something more, and it won't offend. She's like, it won't offend the spirits, or you know, I thought that was a big no. thing. No, no. You thanked them. You offered them. You didn't turn your back. That's different, you know. Uh, I mean, think about it. If I, I don't know, if, if you made aid stuff, and like, like, I was like, oh my god, I really want one of those necklaces, and then I got it. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, this looks ridiculous <laughs> on me. I would pay you for the necklace. And you would, I would thank you for the necklace and the excellent craftsmanship. And then I would be like, you know what, I'm, I'm probably going to give this to my wife. Or, uh, you know, or, 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 but I had this idea. Could you make me, why would you be offended? I honored the deal that we had. I, you know, I, I, I acknowledge your craftsmanship and now I want you to do something else as well. So she went, she doubled down. She's like, let, can you make this happen so that I can be at home more as well? And bam, she, you know, she did it. She got it. People are so afraid of offending spirits, even when they're not specifically dealing with any spirits. It's just like the spirits. <laughs> Also, one of the things that you mention in the book, which is that we're spirits too, and maybe right. it's, we forget that we're also spirits, so we think like, that it's like Big Daddy in the sky who's going to give everything to the, us. What well, you know? Yeah, it's it, it is neither Big Daddy in the sky nor is the unseen world filled with like pissed off millennials waiting to be offended. I am definitely going to use these principles, these keys, and we'll see. In three months, uh, if I can change around my situation, my extremely lucky and privileged situation of kind of silly complaining about it, but um. you know what though that you know that's that's another thing. It probably should have been like a twenty second key. Like if I write three more keys or something, it will be one of them. Um, and, and I don't have a pithy name for it, but essentially, first world problems are still problems. There's always somebody has a worse problem. You know, if, if you're like, oh, you know, I, I make $100,000 a year, but I have to work 70 hours a week, and I really want not to work 70 hours a week, 
there's going to be somebody that works 70 hours, of, you know, 80 hours a week, two jobs and makes $30,000 a year and just be like, what are you complaining about? You know, I've got it so much worse. But then you've got people starving with absolutely no job prospects that would kill for that person's two jobs to, to just put food on the table. So if we get hung up with like an Olympics of hardship, then we never go for anything. And, you know, the first world problems are still your problems. You know, that that's what's real for you. This is what would make your life better. Time is more important than money in a whole host of reasons. You know, you can make more money. You can't make more time. So freeing up your time is sort of, you know, mission number one in the quest for freedom. If you had to choose two or three songs to be the soundtrack of the book, any songs, <laughs> what would those songs be? Oh, man, the soundtrack of a book. Yeah, like the that ideal is... songs to be listening to while you're reading this book. <laughs> oh, man. Um, well... For the one spell, the hot footing spell um, is mentioned in the book where essentially I had done hot footing spells and they were not working at all until the spirit said, go out and listen to Nina Simone sinner, sing Sinner Man. So at three in the morning, I'm out in front of this dude's house listening to Sinner Man on my you know, iPod. And uh, just seeding and how much I wanted this asshole to move. And uh, so Sinner Man by Nina Simone has to be uh, on the list. Dire Straits are getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. So let's say Money for Nothing and Your Chicks for Free. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, a third song, Nowhere Fast by Fire Incorporated, which is from the movie, um, it's, it's from the movie Streets of Fire. It's a, uh, uh, it's by the guy that wrote all of Meatloaf's songs, and it's this, like, Wagnerian robot thing that, that, uh, is in the beginning of the movie. And, uh, it, I don't think the lyrics hold any particular meaning for it, but it's just fast-paced, and it kind of builds up a, you know, yeah, builds up that Wagnerian crescendo. So, uh, we, and I saw the movie recently, so it's on my mind. The, the book isn't there to, to tell anyone what they should be doing with magic. The book isn't there to sell them on, this is your pathway to God through the seven planets, or, or the pathway to, um, Buddhahood through, you know, recitation of mantras or anything like that. It really is, whatever magic you're doing is probably fine. And whether you're using it to become enlightened or to uh, destroy your enemies or to make a million dollars, these are the best practices for making that happen in a meaningful way. How to take your magic and take it next level. How to right. make it even sharper. Guys, in three months, I will update everyone on what happened after I used uh, four specific keys. I'll definitely make a follow-up video talking about whether or not I was able to save my time, save my body, um, and uh, refine and micro-enchant my macro goal of making a lot of money happened. But was I able to do it in a way that's more sustainable? So, that's my favorite. And you know what? It, that kind of stuff happens to me all the time, too. And it, it just opens up the next thing. You know? It, it's, okay, well, this happened. Not quite as I thought. So, what's the next thing? It, it's always good to have a what's next. Right. And I'm excited about the what's next. So, thank you so much again, Jason. Thank you for having me. Please help me run to the rock. Please help me, Lord. All on the day. But the rock right out. I can't hide you the rock right out. I can't hide you the rock right out. <laughs>